All right, well, welcome to our panel on access to healthcare. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, of course, no individual organization or government can guarantee that anybody else is healthy. But what we can do, though, is try to ensure that people have access to quality and affordable health care. This is important not only for its own sake, but because it directly impacts an individual's ability to claim their other human rights. These issues are comprehensively addressed in Articles 25 and 26 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And we have an excellent panel today of people who are going to be speaking about their experiences working in this space. Uh, we will be hearing today from Anna Alicia Bana of the Surya Kanti Foundation. Anna, would you like to just wave for a moment? Um, Thierry Reginas of the ICRC Movability Foundation. Mohamed Mouet, who's here with CSF Global. Pooja Muko from the Jaipur Foot Organization. And last but not least, Yael Neeman of the Suta Medical Centers. I'm not going to share their bios with you. You can read their bios in the conference materials. We want to spend as much time today hearing from them, and our intention is to have a good amount of time at the end for your questions. I know you'll have plenty of questions uh, for our panelists today. So without further ado, could I pass over, please, to Anna for your presentation? I'm Anna Alicia Bana from the Surya Kanti Foundation. And um, my presentation is about uh, the quality of care, especially for children. But before I start, I would like to bring you about what is the trigger, what has triggered my, our, our study about uh, disability. Uh, the, I mean, uh, from UNICEF, <coughs> Robert Meyer has, has um, uh, speak that question, has question, what happened actually was the children who survived the, new, the infant period, especially in rural area. What is their quality of life? So that was the trigger for me. What, how, to, how to monitor the children, uh, in, in the, especially in developing countries? Our, our foundation is working with uh, is prevention as well as management of childhood disability. We aim to improve the quality of life of children with disability, focusing on the underserved areas in Indonesia. We provide especially special education as well as, as, well as clinical therapy for uh, for these children, and besides that, we also provide uh, education for mothers and health workers to monitor child development. In doing so, we enable them to detect potential developmental delays as early as possible, and as you know, developmental delay is a proxy for disability in young children. What, what, is, what, what do we believe? We believe that early detection and early intervention of developmental delay can reduce the severity of many conditions and help children to adapt in life. And as you know, uh, uh, and also to develop the children to, to, to develop to their full potentials. Our problem is, especially in rural areas, is developmental screening is not part of the routine examination of health services due to the lack of health professionals and large population. Our approach is that to teach village health workers and mothers to be able to monitor the child development to stimulate delayed children and to refer help to health professionals as early as possible 
is a developmental delay is identified. Our motivation, innovation is actually Surya Kanti has developed a simple screening method, a tool for child development to monitor and, and together included to stimulate children in, with developmental delays. This is one tool that we developed. Uh, we call it the pictorial developmental milestone uh, tool. And you can see that this that, uh, that covers four developmental uh, developmental uh, domains. And uh, in the application, we use this as a home-based monitoring for early identification of child developmental delays and to conduct and to act immediate action. This, this tool can also be used for epidemiological service. And as you, as you know, as maybe for in your information, in Indonesia, we have very few, I mean, if, I mean um, data on uh, child development from very young children, from zero to five, is uh, very poor. We also can use this tool to add for school readiness. If a child, to a child to be ready for school, he should be able to sit down, uh, sit down quietly, to follow instruction, to be self, can to do self-regulation, and of course to enjoy learning. But for that, he has to be his developmental status has to be appropriate for his, for his age. Besides use as a developmental, a simple development or monitoring, this tool can also be used for, uh, for identification of simple diseases, of diseases uh, related to disability, such as, uh, I mean, uh, for autism, like uh, for autism, you also suspect cerebral palsy, second one, and also for ADHD, and also for Down syndrome. You can see that the green line is the normal age, but then the graphic of the red line, that is then the the developmental uh, uh, I mean, picture of its uh, developmental uh, problem. At this stage, of course, we cannot say this, has no, this is a diagnosis, but this is more suspected for a certain uh, disability. Uh, uh, Surakandi Input Mobile has tried to solve social problems, but as I mentioned, that in many rural areas and underserved areas, knowledge of our child development is very low. And as well as the high risk of, of development uh, delay. And uh, the activities that we provide is actually we adapt to uh, to uh, to, uh, to provide easy to to use a child monitoring tool like this one that I pre uh, presented early, pre earlier, and also to train health workers and preschool teachers for <clears throat> to use the pictorial development monitor, and also to train mothers how to monitor the child at home and give stimulation. So in fact, it is actually a home-based monitoring child done by the mothers and uh, I mean assisted by the community health workers. The outcomes that we expected is the health workers and teachers can monitor the child development. Mothers are aware of the child delays and can act early. Mothers can act, yeah, act early when a development, developmental delay is, is, uh, is, is developed, is, can be seen, 
and health workers and teachers can refer children with delays. So the ultimate goal that we found, that we expect is actually that uh, development delay can, can be identified through early stimulation and referral. And the impact will be easy to do. The impact over the past 10 years, we have, I mean, we have already about 7,000 uh, tools get distributed, about 1,000 uh, 1, training, about 3,000 uh, people trained, and 80,000 mothers and child received. received. We have done it in, uh, in urban areas, we have done it in rural areas, and also done for rural epidemiology studies. We have some other success stories. It's done for, for a child with, the, with Down syndrome. We has come to our clinic and um, we, we assist them for uh, the therapy and the child is now uh, has, uh, has developed very well and is it included in the, uh, uh, how do you call it, is, uh, is the, gets the gold medal for the West Java team in National Stadium Paralympic in, in Makassar for swimming. We have other success stories, and that is when in the stores of chains in the school, in the, pre, uh, in the daycare schools, where the child is easily monitored and can immediately develop, I mean, uh, receive in the, I mean, therapy. Those sound like wonderful, wonderful okay. results of your of your projects, and I, I apologize for um, cutting you off there. We have a very full panel, but thank you for giving us an overview of some really valuable work to help ensure that children are being identified and uh, getting the supports that they need from a very early age. A round of applause, please, for Anna. And hopefully during the Q&A, we can get into some of the material that you, you also have still um, to present there. Um, we'll move next to Thierry Regenas of the ICRC Movability Foundation. Thierry. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, the ICRC Movability Foundation is a, a foundation created by the ICRC and active since over 30 years in low and middle income countries. Uh, in order to build or rebuild physical rehabilitation system and support persons with disabilities in accessing products and services. So um, the problem we are faced is that in a vast majority of low and middle income countries, rehabilitation is clearly not a priority and uh, WHO estimates that 80% of uh, persons with disabilities uh, in uh, developing countries need assistive technology. There is a lack of budget, a lack of uh, know-how, and a lack of services and service providers. Uh, in short, there's very often no policy on how to deal with, uh, with the rehabilitation of uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, it's a real problem because rehabilitation is a first step towards inclusion, towards enjoying a normal life, towards enjoying socioeconomic rights. It is not only a health issue as the theme of this panel, but it's also a right and inclusion issue as it is mentioned in the article 26 of the, of the CRPD. So for instance, uh, movability has been present in Togo since 2004 trying to set up and strengthen the, the rehabilitation system, uh, the sector in, in the country. Um, there's been improved access to services uh, uh, and devices. However, there was a lack of manager, management capacities and especially national coordination. Uh, so the, the action we could take was, was limited. 
The question is how to overcome a lack of priority, a lack of focus, a lack of budget, a lack of know-how. And this is when Movability started to develop the concept of a national platform that will promote the rights and inclusion of persons with disabilities. The idea is to um, bring together all the stakeholder in a given country, uh, that means the physical rehabilitation sector, the, the, uh, per, the DPOs, the Ministry of Health, or maybe Ministry of Social uh, Security, Social Welfare, uh, and uh, the Red Cross, the National Red Cross Organization, to go together and to discuss about the issue and to develop a national policy. This seems like inventing uh, sliced bread. Indeed, it's not rocket science, uh, rocket science but uh, it wasn't done in most of the countries where we are working, and it isn't done in, in many, many low and income countries. So in this, it is an innovative tool uh, because it was the first multi-sectoral platform in the country, and um, it creates a discussion space for the building of the rehabilitation sector as a whole. It allows to not only develop ideas, but to get to concrete solution. Um, because all the actors of the civil society are consulted, synergies can be developed, and uh, uh, at the beginning, this national platform, this roundtable is coordinated by movability, but in the end, uh, this platform should be owned by the local actor. It's a model that is replicable uh, in other countries, and uh, we have already very good results in Tanzania, where uh, finally uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, should be very soon part of the national health policy of Tanzania, which was not the case until now, uh, thanks to the, to, the, to the platform and the policy that is being drafted. Uh, we are starting to work on that also in Benin, in Côte d'Ivoire and Haiti, and we will try to develop in other um, countries. It has an impact on, at many levels. First of all, a resource increase uh, uh, can be noted. In Togo, it was very clear there has been an increase in 150% of the budget allocated to the rehabilitation center, the main one uh, in Lomé, the CNAO. Um, because often it's a question of budget. If there's no policy, there is no budget, and so no means for that. Um, there is a national policy, and this national policy also raises the awareness on disability issues in a country. It changes the political agenda, and it, change, it can change also the perception. And finally, uh, uh, there is an improvement of the access uh, to, uh, um, to rehabilitation services and devices for persons with disabilities. Um, a concrete story is the one of Sovon, who is a teacher, school teacher, who suffered a, a car accident a few years ago and lost his right leg. Uh, and basically, he was, uh, he, he couldn't work anymore and he was, he was set aside. And with the fact that this policy started to work, he's one of the beneficiaries of high quality device. And now he works again, uh, which of course is great not only for, for him and his family, but I mean for all, for his, his, his students too. And he can even play football, which uh, for a Togolese is very important. So, uh, so uh, that's quite an achievement. But to, to look at it from a more general perspective, um, uh, the, the umbrella organization of Togo, of DPOs, uh, also was very happy to be given the occasion to really be part of uh, drafting the policy, of, of moving uh, uh, the issue forward and to bring about change. Because in the platform, well, movability tries to facilitate, but the essential role must be given to the uh, disabled people, persons organization. Uh, that, that, that's the, these are the key person who can bring forward the issues. Of course, a few challenges exist uh, because a platform is, is not enough. It can be only a building block. Then it must be sustainable. And uh, finally, uh, uh, we want it also to be replicable. Um, as a building block, 
it, was, it is only one issue. Then other issues need to be developed, like education, uh, the creation of a pipeline of trained professionals in a given country or region. The quality of services must often be uh, improved, and uh, we're trying to work also on a better access to the, to the services for the persons in need. And finally, uh, uh, surrounding that, we are working also on improving the management capacities of, uh, of the professional and the, the, the service provider. The sustainability will be key. It is our ambition to be able to leave a country with a system in place, but obviously uh, 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 this can be done only if there is a clear and stable policy with uh, a budget and with uh, administrative and technical skills that are ensured in the country. Uh, it should be clearly owned by the national authorities. If not, it will not work. And finally, um, uh, we promote and engage in the uh, replicability of the platform uh, through notably leadership and management and governance senior leadership in other countries and try to, 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 to get this movement to also work in the same uh, spirit to have the, the, the platform replicated in other countries. In a nutshell, the main impact of a national platform is to have a national policy and have the resources needed for physical rehabilitation in a country, which will lead to social economic inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thierry. Mohammed, please. Good afternoon. I'm Mohamed Muhit for CSF Global. We are going to present the work we are doing in Bangladesh in mainstreaming children with disabilities in Bangladesh. Um, how does it work? No. This one? So CSF Global is a research-focused organization which also provides service delivery as well as advocacy and networking. We have been operating in Bangladesh since year 2000. Initially, we started our work doing research and service delivery for children who are blind and visually impaired, but gradually we expanded our work to all type of childhood disability. We have focused on epidemiological research at the community level to get the prevalence data on different type of disabilities, which helps us to plan more effectively at the local, regional, and national level. We use that data for advocacy and networking, and we do a lot of advocacy work with the government, policymakers, using those data and providing changing policies. In terms of service delivery, our main focus or strategy is community-based rehabilitation, and all our work is focused at the community level, empowering the community members from case detection to service delivery to referral. We also provide medical services to remote areas in Bangladesh, and also we are expanding into assistive device uh, provision for children and children with disabilities. So this particular project was based in one of the northern districts of Bangladesh, Shiraz Ganj and Shahjatpur sub-district. And this area, we had about 300 villages, 70,000 households, and half a million population. One of the major barriers that we found during the community-based research that a lot of the children with disability, they are hidden in the community. And the main reason for that is stigma. The social uh, norm or the beliefs system in the community. In Bangladesh, the literacy rate is very low, and we have widespread poverty. Together, they actually enhance all sorts of stigma related to children with disability. So when we went there for survey, we found that the traditional survey method doesn't work. If you go there as an outsider in a community, people don't accept you and people don't tell you about their children with disability. To overcome that barrier, we developed this method which we are calling key informant method, by which we are actually training local volunteers 
from all sphere of the life, and particularly people who are living in the community for a long term, and people who know the community either because of their occupation or social role. That can be NGO workers working in that area, religious leaders, school teachers, uh, local elected members, government officers, health workers, and community leaders. We develop simple training methods so that uh, with a lot of pictures and flip charts so that disability in children can be identified by local volunteers. It's a short training, but we found it very effective in motivating the local community, in empowering the local community, and increasing the capacity of the local community to identify children in remote rural areas. Because in many low and middle income countries, we simply don't have enough resources, we simply don't have enough trained health professionals to go out in the community and find these children. So we found this method will have a long-term impact in every community where we go. So these key informants are trained, and once they're trained, we have to remember we are not training them to do conventional screening. What we are doing is disseminating the knowledge through this social network. We're identifying this existing social network. We're identifying these people who are relied upon by the local community for advice, for information. And we are giving them the information, and they are spreading that information through their network, through their regular vocation. So the school teacher will go back to the school and tell other children and their parents about different type of childhood disability. <coughs> Similarly, the health workers who are visiting the households, now they are trained to identify children with disability, and they will spread the knowledge. And at the end, we will prepare a list from every village of suspected disabled children. Once they are identified, we will send a medical team for proper medical assessment because we did not want to mislevel a single child with any type of disability. So all children are brought into the camp, which has a mul uh, multidisciplinary team led by a pediatrician, but also with a physiotherapist, nurse, and other relevant professionals. They went through a detailed medical assessment, and once they are diagnosed with the condition, then we start providing them with the services. Till December 2017, we have identified 1,500 children with severe disability in that one sub-district. In Bangladesh, we have 500 of sub-districts like that. So any numbers that you see here, you can multiply that with 500, and that's the number you can expect uh, in Bangladesh with children with disability. So we expected that over 350,000 children are there with cerebral palsy in Bangladesh which gives us a prevalence of four per thousand children. An estimated 0.7 per thousand children are blind or visually impaired. An estimated 650,000 children are uh, suffering from different type of disability, including blindness, physical impairment, hearing impairment, and epilepsy. So once they're identified, we provide services through a model of CBR, and one of the key uh, element of that program is to create an inclusive club at the community level where children with disability, their parents, and from the locality, children without disability can come regularly and interact and play and learn. That has a long-term impact onto the society because we are taking a public health approach where all our interventions are targeted not only at the child level, but also at the family level, community level, and policy level. So at the child and family level, we are providing advice and services for personal health, nutrition, assistive devices, rehabilitation, therapy, education, inclusive education, linking them with the mainstream education as well, whenever it is possible. At the community level, we are focusing on community awareness, accessibility, and integration. And at the policy level, a lot of advocacy and policy change through the government initiatives. Uh, we have distributed over 1,000 wheelchairs among those children who required them, mostly children with cerebral palsy. Recently, we have established a local uh, workshop to develop these special wheelchairs, which is adjustable because these children grow up very quickly and we, have, we cannot afford to have new wheelchair every time. So we are 
now following this special design which is adjustable and provides special support to these children. In terms of accessibility, once you give the wheelchair, then you we found that a lot of the households and the schools and the community uh, spaces, they don't have accessible uh, ramps. So we developed a uh, lot of ramps in the community. We provide parents' education and rehabilitation into that space and social participation. Uh, we are doing a lot of other, other things like incontinence. We are providing them reusable nappy, uh, oral health, and awareness building is done through different type of activities. So we are trying to provide a one-step, one-stop solution for all these services advocacy work at the community level so that we can engage the community at the local level and deliver our services and advocacy work. I would like to acknowledge all the partners who are supporting in different ways uh, all our programs in Bangladesh. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Mohammed. We'll turn now to uh, Pooja. Can I have the slides, please? Yeah. yeah. Good morning. I'm Dr. Pooja Mukul, the technical director of BMBSS, Jaipur Foot Organization India. We are a non governmental organization committed to remobilizing amputees. Our objective is to make artificial limbs available, accessible, and affordable. The number of amputees worldwide is rising at an alarming rate. More than one million people lose their limb every year, which means a new amputee is added to this existing population every 30 seconds. 80% of these amputees live in the low and middle income countries. The World Health Organization estimates this number to be over 30 million. Ironically, all research in prosthetics is directed towards people living in the high-income countries. But let us not get dissuaded by that, because living in low-income countries or middle-income countries, if all we focus on are challenges, we could spend the rest of our lives and not achieve anything. So let's just look at opportunities here. So, we realized that only 5 to 15 percent of our patients had access to artificial limbs. And without artificial limbs, they're stripped of basic rights like access to health, education, employment, participation in the community. However, the premise that we took to begin with when we started working on artificial limbs was that the foremost deterrent to artificial limbs in the low and middle income countries was the cost. We believed that all the cutting edge technology available in the West uh, is not ac accessible and available to us because it's so expensive. So we started making inexpensive replicas of what was being used in the West. What you see here is a satch foot. That's a solid ankle cushion heel foot. We made inexpensive replicas of it, and the patients rejected it. You see, it has a solid ankle. It does not permit people in our cultures to sit on the floor, squat. These are, these are postures that are an essential part of our culture. So something or a design that worked so well in the West was a disaster in India. So we decided that we could not wait for the West to come up with solutions for us, and here is an opportunity for us to indigenize and innovate and come up with designs and technology that is appropriate for the socio-cultural, environmental, religious needs of our people. So we designed the Jaipur foot that you see on the other side. Now the Jaipur foot is a variable density rubber foot. It is the only foot in the world, even today, that permits people to squat, sit cross-legged, allows them to use it with or without shoes, As you can see here, you know, these are patients using the Jaipur foot. They can squat, sit cross-legged. It costs just $10. People can use it with or without shoes. They can run. They can climb trees. Now, why I am mentioning that it can be used without shoes is not because we are so poor that we can't afford shoes, but because it is very important for us to have a prosthetic device 
that can be used without shoes because we cannot enter our places of worship, which are the temples and mosques without shoes. So when we talk about a barefoot prosthetic design, people start judging us that this is a low income design because these people are so poor, they don't have shoes, so they need a design like that. But I want to just put this in perspective that the reason why we need this is because of our religious needs and our social cultural needs. Currently, the Jaipur foot is the most widely used foot across the developing world. For patients who lose their limbs from above the, li above the knee, the only option available in the developing world is a single axis knee joint with or without a lock. Could I have the video, please? With a joint like this, the patient walks with a straight knee gait, which is ergonomically inefficient and cosmetically awkward. So in partnership with Stanford University and DREV, we started designing a high performance, affordable knee for above knee amputees. And we came up with the Jaipur Remotion design. That is Piyush, and you can see that he's walking with a bent knee. He's bending it just like he's bending the other knee. The Jaipur knee featured in the Time magazine as one of the 50 best inventions of the world for 2009. It has so far been used in over 12,000 patients across 15 countries. A lot of times when we are developing technology for the low and middle income countries, we keep our standards low. We decided to change that. The Jaipur Remotion Knee is ISO 10328 certified, CE marked, FDA approved, and is currently being marketed across the world, including the US. The other innovation that we did is we pioneered the use of high density polyethylene pipes. Everywhere in the world when they're making prosthetic devices, they are using sheets. So we, we chose a cylindrical pipe to reform it into a cylindrical leg. So we get a seamless limb, and when, where there is no seam, there is less likelihood of failure. So this is what the Jaipur limb looks like. Our technology is also called the rap rapid fit technology because the time that we take from the measurement taking to limb fitting is just four to six hours. What has been our impact? So far, we have fitted more than half a million limbs in India and across 30 different countries. When we talk about artificial limbs, it is not just mobility because in a medical perspective, an artificial limb replaces a lost body part, but in the social context, it is an enabler in a disabling environment. And in the economic context, it breaks the cycle of poverty, disability, and more poverty, or disability, poverty, and more disability, however you want to look at it. If by providing an artificial limb to a person in a low or middle income country, we can even increase their earning potential by a dollar a day, if you calculate it for the numbers that we deal with, the sum is astronomical. Although we designed our prosthetic technology, the prosthetic foot and the knee for the needs of, unique needs of Indian amputees, the designs that have evolved have universal appeal. And they have transcended geographical boundaries and are being used across 30 countries. We get our funding from the government, from corporates, from individuals, and research grants. The next steps are, of course, scaling, because so far, there are about 27 million people in the low and middle income countries still waiting for artificial limbs. So we have miles to go before we sleep. Continuing research, we have research partners like MIT and Stanford, and so we want to continue to develop more effective designs. And we want to translate physical mobility into social and economic empowerment. These are some of our difficult cases. Could we have the video, please? Nitesh, as you can see his legs, he was born with limb deficiencies and deformities. His parents were advised an amputation to which they did not consent. As you would see, till he came to us, he was crawling, as is evident from the callosities on his legs. We didn't have much confidence when we fitted him with limbs, and, and he, he shocked us when he walked like this. This is Shubham, a double amputee, and you can see he's taken to the artificial limb like they are his own. The guy, he's 
going to shake his hands with is a double amputee himself. He's a cobbler. 30% of our prosthetic technicians are amputees themselves, and they multitask as trainers, counselors, and prosthetists. This is Farhat. He lost all four limbs due to electric burns. We had no expectations, but we realized the limitations were in our mind, not in his. Finally, I'd like to quote Steve Jobs. He says, it's not faith in technology, it's faith in people, and I see it all the time. The magic lies in the resilience and the indomitability of the human spirit and not in the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pooja. And last but certainly not least, Yael. Good afternoon. My name is Yael Neeman. I'm the head of service and patient experience at Asuta Medical Centers, which is one of the largest chain of medical centers in Israel. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to dedicate it to a dear friend of mine, Mrs. Netta Rotman from Access Israel Organization. Netta was supposed to attend this important conference and to be here with us today, was a very special human being, wise, highly motivated, goal-oriented, and passionate about everything she did. Netta was very devoted to promoting accessibility in Israel. Therefore, the Israeli society, by and large, including us, Asuta members, feel greatly indebted to her, to her. We were lucky to know Netta, to work with her, and to learn from her. Dear Netta, we already miss you. You are in our hearts forever. Netta, Auva. As a healthcare organization that cares about people, naturally we have a vision which says that Asuta shall promote the health and quality of life in Israel by providing quality medical care and health experience, placing the person, his dignity, needs, hopes, and freedom of choice at the top of his priorities. Within this vision, we undertake to become a model for excellence in promoting the health and treatment experience in Israel and to be worthy for the trust and hopes that our patients and their families have in us. Based on our vision, accessibility in our organization is an absolute must. When we started to handle accessibility, we first had to learn that accessibility means much more than dealing with physical obstacles. We also learned that we had to identify the entire chain of patient hospital interfaces with reference to the patient's entire journey prior to, during, and after their visit in our hospitals. The following are the three main domains we dealt with in the framework of the, in the, framework of the project. Physical accessibility, accessibility in service, and team education and training. Concerning physical accessibility, we, we have ensured maximum possible accessibility of hospital buildings, corridors, test rooms, beds, and other medical equipment. This is despite the fact that there was no relevant regulation by the Ministry of Health in Israel. Asuta Customer Relationship Center plays a key role in ensuring consistency in accessibility throughout the entire patient journey. The call center has been made accessible through multi-channels enabling contact, contact by sending written messages on the top of the traditional use of the telephone. Initial contact to the center can also be made through Asuta's website by email, as well as through exchange of text messages according to the patient's specific needs. Any person declaring or claiming to have disabilities is asked by their service, service representative, what adjustment are we required to make during your visit in our hospitals? Asking this direct and open question enables the, the patient to express himself, his needs, such an accompaniment of a blind patient from the hospital entrance or from the nearest bus or train station, availing sign language interpreter service, etc. With this attitude, we are able to respond to each and every request. 
the contact center communicates to the relevant dep hospital department the patient's appointment plus the required adjustments. The organization's person, person in charge of accessibility is also kept by, um, up to date and he helps and support the team creating the appropriate environment on the medical examination day. At Asuta, any type of information, general as well as personal, is available in different accessible formats, adapted to patients' individual or specific needs. So a partially or fully blind patient can access general or personal information in an enlarged format, braille, braille font, or voice file, etc. Likewise, patients with cognitive disability will be able to access information in a simplified format. As part of our policy to make information accessible to everyone, we provide sign language services in the hospital premises. We were aware of the huge significance of this service, which was even more highlighted when we received thank you letters. Once the thank you letter, the letter came from a deaf mom whose hearing daughter had to undergo an MRI test. The little child was feeling uneasy in the, in the noisy MRI machine, a noise that her mom couldn't hear at all. When the technician did his best to calm the child down, the real-time interpretation of what was going on into sign language ensured the mom that her little daughter was in the best hands possible, which calmed her as well. Service animal policy is a good example of one of our challenges in this project. When we started forming our policy, we knew that service animals were permitted in most places in Israel. The problem was that there were no official government policy, regulation, nor standards on this issue applying to hospitals and medical centers. We decided to study the policy, strategies, and principles in, in practice in the US, adopting this as a guiding model in our medical centers. Based on the information we gathered, we formed our own policy, which permits service animal into all hospital facilities, except for surgery rooms, and rooms where invasive procedures take place. In parallel to physical aspects of accessibility and accessibility in service, ASUTA has been addressing the, challenge issue, the challenging issue of the team education and training. The staff members are all those facing patients. It's their behavior in the moment of truth <coughs> they behave in the moment of truth, their ability to come up with the right solutions, their sensitive attitude and resourcefulness, which many times makes the difference between service that is sensitive and accessible and one which is not. Every Asuta staff member, whether or not giving a direct service, participates in a four-hour training session, which includes experiential learning given by guides with disabilities from Access Israel organization. All 3,000 Asuta employees participate in this educational session, and every new worker participates in this educational program in the framework of Asuta Medical Center School of Professionalism. We at Asuta have developed an interactive educational software dealing with disabilities, as it is part of and this is part of the organization core educational e-learning programs, which include, for example, blood transfusion, safety, and other mandatory topics. Every service providing staff member has to take this course once a year. In May 2017, we launched an extraordinary activity, both in terms of, the, of its scope and innovative nature. The organization CEO announced the opening of an accessibility week which included experiential activities to which Asuta's, Asuta's workers and family enroll in advance through a designated mini-site. The Accessibility Week activities included a workshop in sign language, lectures given by inspiring people, accessibility visits, people with disabilities who arrived to Asuta Medical Center and made a several hours visit along with the local management to highlight the adapted needed for such services as CT scan, eye examination, MRI, mammography, etc. 
Screening the movie The Belia Family in three cinemas in Israel, the dedicate this evening especially for this unique experience for Suta's workers and family. That week was very touching, inspiring, and very successful. So what's the bottom line? Accessibility means accountability and responsibility, leaving nothing to chance. Therefore, we integrated accessibility in our policy and standards, develop our own education and training programs, adopt accessibility as general part of our regular control system in medical care and services, ensure accessibility budget is an integral part of our annual budget, learn and draw lessons from complaint. So, to sum up, we've hit the road, we are doing our best, but we are aware that there is still a long way to go. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really struck by some of the commonalities of the themes that we've heard today. It, it seems that you're all, in, in the various activities that you're engaged in, you're all really looking at people in their context um, to find culturally appropriate um, approaches um, that are sustainable, resource appropriate, and truly promote inclusion and empowerment of people. And I'm also struck by the common theme of training and capacity building of those that you're working with. Um, whether that's addressing stigma or making sure that people have appropriate policies in place. Um, one of the joys of, of being a chair of a panel is that uh, because you have the microphone, you get to ask the first question. But I'm going to hold off because I have a million questions to ask. And I want to make sure, because we have a decent amount of time left, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to hear from you. So if you have a question, please wave. We'll try to point at you. If you could please remember to use the microphone. Just give a brief introduction, your name, where you're from, so that we know who you are. Um, and um, I'd like to take a moment here to open up the floor to you. I see a hand up, sir, the gentleman wearing the glasses there, yes. Uh, I'm I'm Birendra Pokhrel from Nepal, so I'm wondering uh, how the people with intellectual disability in Israel getting adequate health services. As your presentation is very much uh, wonderful and it has uh, highlighted so many uh, best practices about providing health services, but I'm wondering about the issue of persons with intellectual disability who don't have their own voice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can you, can you repeat the, the question? The, the people with disability that yeah, don't I have... Mean, I mean, yeah, as you mentioned about the different disability categories, the, the blind and the deaf, so uh, the two persons and the children with intellectual disability who cannot say what is being happened on their body part and their structure. So how they come up with their problems and who identify their problem and how the health services is being provided to them. I use my interpreter. calling, no. my interpreter. <laughs> Um, first of all, any information that is needed for uh, people, pa patients with cognitive disability, things that we know in advance, we prepare them in simplified uh, versions, for simplified language, and this is something that Asuta does on a regular basis. And also, yeah. and also the training that they undergo, as she said, every single year, four mandatory hours, include training on how to provide services for people with cognitive disability. And it is done by um, uh, instructors with cognitive disability. No? Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Other questions, comments? Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a question from the front. Uh, yes. I, I, first of all, this was a fascinating, fascinating uh, uh, panel. And I, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Muhit. First of all, uh, I think this is the beauty of Zero Project because we were sitting and listening to your presentation and immediately taking it to how we can use it and duplicate it uh, in Israel. Because uh, there are societies that are very culturally are very similar to the structure that you're talking about, very closed and, and to take the agents, as you explained, train them, it, it is fascinating. Do you have materials? that can be duplicated, how, how, how can we learn from you uh, more? Thank you very much. Uh, we have developed a lot of training material which can be understood by laymen, if you like, non-medical people. And it's mostly based on pictorial flip charts and we have pilot tested them. So we will be happy to share the English version that we have. But I would also suggest that you can use that flip chart, but it's always better to uh, replace our, the pictures with local children and local pictures. Of it's course. always more effective. So we'll be happy to share that. We we'll would love to talk. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Well, I will, I will take the opportunity to ask my question then to build on your question for our panelists. If there's somebody in the audience here who wishes to either replicate or build upon what you've been doing or has been, been inspired by what you've shared today, what is one piece of advice that you would give to them um, to ensure that they could be as successful as possible? Was there a mistake you made early on that you would like to share and say, don't do this, that didn't work for us, or something that in retrospect you have found to be really valuable in your work that you would want to share. Um, Mohammed, you've already mentioned that the need to make sure that things are culturally appropriate. Um, should we start at that end and work our way back? Mohammed, would you like to go first? I would say start small and do piloting, whatever you do. Don't go for a big project and scale it up before doing the piloting. I think then you can fine-tune everything, whatever you do, by doing the piloting. Thank you. Anna, what advice would you have for folks? Uh, yes, I would like to suggest that every mother should uh, be able to monitor uh, children before the age of five years. Because early detection and early uh, stimulation is more, uh, how to call it, more more appropriate or more uh, more better if the if if you do it with in, uh, with the young is very young because it's related to the golden age and also related to the development of the brain, so you will have better uh, better result. So it sounds as though you're really stressing the need to engage families themselves to empower those families yeah. to help their children. Yeah, especially in, in developing countries. I mean, mother. I mean, we have lack of professionals. So if the mothers are really involved in a home-based monitoring program, that will be wonderful. Thank you, Yael. I think that making uh, the call center accessible is very important, and if I knew it. At the beginning, I would have done it much more uh, uh, earlier, um, in much more earlier stage of the project. Uh, because we've got uh, uh, the various requirements and, uh, and the adaptations, and it's actually upgraded. So if I knew it, I would do it earlier. So for those who may not be utilizing a call center, but other outreach approaches, whether that's social media or a call line, a hotline, something like that, really making sure that all aspects of that outreach are accessible to people. Thank you. Thierry? Thank you, yeah. Um, building a national platform, uh, I mean, the idea is to have an impact at policy level. So it sometimes it's, it's the most difficult is to get the access point. Uh, movability has done it, does it or has done it through 
uh, its connection with the service provider, the rehabilitation centers, and through the, the National Red Cross or Red Crescent Society. Um, but uh, I guess what's important, if, if another organization would like to do a similar job, well, first of all, is really to work with, with, with the, deep, the national DPO, uh, because it, it requires somehow uh, some, some advocacy work to, 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 to make the issue known uh, among decision makers, or at least among, uh, here we talk about the social, the, the health professional, social professional, uh, uh, policy makers of, of a country. Uh, so advocacy would be important. Um, and in some cases we've used uh, sport, for instance, uh, in Tanzania, uh, between Tanzania and Rwanda also, uh, we, to, to, to organize sports event uh, for, for uh, para sport then creates a debate also and, and shows a positive image in the country and facilitates then also then the discussion uh, uh, on this type of issues. Great, thank you. Pooja. My takeaway, especially to the low and middle income country participants is don't be overridden by your challenges. Everybody has problems. It's not like people in Austria don't have a problem and people in Germany don't have a problem. They all have their problems. And just look for opportunities. Because I feel if as care providers, if as leaders in the disability space, we let challenges get to us, we pass on that energy to our patients or the people we are caring for and they also get overridden by challenges. They feel if we can't do it, they can't do it. So always pass on an energy saying that it's not a big deal, you can do it. We can do it. Because you can if you think you can. And I don't think there should be anything stopping us. We didn't let it stop us that you know we are such a large population, so many amputees, and there's nobody finding solutions for us. Because you can't wait for somebody else to take care of your problems. They're your problems and the solutions have to come from you. And I think you should just get started on whatever problems you have. And there are lots of people to help you. And especially on a platform like this, Zero Project, we are not here to, to talk challenges. We are just here to get somebody, find an opportunity, find a partner, and overcome those challenges. Thank you for that positive advice as well. Another opportunity, is there any last questions or comments from the floor? And we would encourage you also to please come and, and talk to people after the panel. I'm sure they would welcome the opportunity to have a more in-depth discussion with you in person. With that then, I'm going to turn it over to our graphic artist who has been diligently toiling away with her, with her Sharpie pens. Um, and I'm really shocked that you don't have carpal tunnel by now because I don't know how many sessions you've done today, but it's got to be quite a few. This is the third one. Okay, well, we have a few moments here to hear from you. Thank you for your graphic summation. Maybe some light. Oh, thank you. So, um, well, a lot of innovative ideas and practices we heard about all, from all around the world, actually. Um, Let's start with the project in Indonesia, where it was all about early detection of possible disabilities within children, because, as you mentioned, um, your belief is that early intervention is the key. So there is, has been a tool developed to identify disabilities on a very early stage in life, and we just heard before the age of five would be perfect. Um, then another one. <laughs> Uh, C CSF Global, um, we heard about the one thing I remember the most is that key informants are being trained to talk to communities because children with disabilities are highly stigmatized and I think that's maybe the cause in many countries and especially um, in this case. So these key informants are trained so that they can identify children in need and then those children can get support and can be empowered together with their parents and their families so that they don't fall out of the society. Or another one, I'll go here. Okay. Uh, 
Rehabilitation for people with disabilities has been um, neglected in many countries and we heard from an example in Togo where an innovative tool was developed. It is a platform for policies, for policy politic makers, so that they understand the importance of rehabilitation for people with disabilities. Multiple stakeholders have been involved so that they learn on how to support people and then people find jobs again. So especially after having an accident or so, it's easier to come back to work. Enable people um, with amputations. Um, to me, as a European, classic European person, it was very, very interesting to hear that uh, most of uh, the prosthetic designs were made for people living in the westernized um, culture. And they are, first of all, very expensive, and second of all, don't fit the needs, especially the religious and socio-cultural needs of uh, different countries, in this case of India. So they have to be adapted to the needs of the people in the country. Just one example, um, having a prosthetic foot uh, that can be shown even when you go without your shoes into the temple because that is, I assume, socially acceptable more than if you have this uh, prosthetic foot that is not adapted. Or um, medical care. Medical care for people with disabilities, all of them to be mentioned, deaf people, blind people, people of course with mobility li limitations and people who have um, learning disabilities, to them, it's always very difficult to come into a hospital or any other um, medical care center. So what we heard was that um, at Asuta Medical Centers, the person is put in the center. The needs of the person are the central focus. So um, as an example, via telephone, people can be easily contacted or contact the center and then they are asked, what do you need? What do you need to have access to our services? And so trust is built on a very early stage. Um, it is all about accessibility um, for people with disabilities to the medical care. We also heard of an example of a sign language service within um, your center where a deaf mother could be in contact with her child. So that is just one um, example on how important it is to provide all kinds of services that you can for people with disabilities in the uh, medical center. I think that's all. Did I forget anyone? No, I think I have all of them, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I, I continue to be in awe of your ability to do that. And I'm also in awe of the great work that's going on um, that our panelists were presenting on. Really tremendous work. Thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. One final round of applause for, for our panelists. <laughs>